Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation. Uh, we look at a number of issues. So we used to look at them in the real world. We now look at them in the virtual world. And one of the major focuses that we have is fintech, what's been going on. We've been running a briefing meeting on fintech every month for the last, what, three or four years. Our anchor is Jemima Kelly, uh, ace reporter for FT Alphaville, who is back tweeting, writing, uh, an extraordinary amount on uh, fintech at the moment, at the present time with a, a healthy degree of cynicism. She will anchor this meeting. I'm delighted also that we have with us, we have uh, Jeff Lynn, the uh, chairman and co-founder of Cedars. Uh, Jeff is executive chairman and co-founder of Cedars. Um, and as I'm sure you know, Cedars and Crowdcube have announced uh, that they are merging. He co-founded Cedars, I think, somewhere between 2009 and 2012. The, the various sources seem to say different things. He's also a vice chairman of the European Crowdfunding Network and a chairman, the, uh, the chairman of the Commission for a Digital Economy, COADIC. Um, I noticed that he and I both went to the same American university, but you know we're both forgiven, I hope, for that. Uh, my colleague, Leighton Hughes, has uh, produced an agenda for this particular meeting, and I'll ask him to run very quickly through that agenda. But let me first of all ask Jeff to talk a little bit, if he can, about the uh, forthcoming merger between Crowdcube and Cedars. Jeff. Gladly. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, yes, we're we're very we're very excited about this. I mean, at one level, Cedars and Crowdcube have have both been rivals, you know, fairly publicly so uh, for quite some time. But in reality, we've both been working on trying to do something very similar, which is it, which is open up private investment uh, uh, to a wider, more democratic, more far flung group of investors uh, than it has historically been open to, and at the same time, allow private businesses a transparent, open marketplace. Uh, through which to raise capital. And we've gone about it slightly different ways, and we've certainly had our different techniques and approaches and areas of emphasis. Um, but both of us really have very similar missions. And over the years, we've talked at first sort of very casually and, and, and recently much more seriously about what could we achieve if we tried to do this together? What could we achieve if we really tried to pursue the big scale opportunity that we know is there uh, 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 as a joint firm, and 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 as the talks proceeded, we all got pretty excited about it. Um, and you know, as these things go, you have some, you have all the back and forth of the legal and, and documentary negotiations. But but uh, uh, last week we finally got to the point where we were able to sign and announce uh, the deal. Um, we've got still regulatory approvals, a number of other things uh, to go through. So 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 it won't it won't close for. Uh, some months, and we continue to be fully independent businesses operating our platforms and businesses as they were. Um, but we're really very much looking forward to coming together, uh, building on the best of what both of us have built, and uh, building a really great combined uh, fintech business. Well, I'm sure that, that Jemima has some thoughts on this, but let me ask you the obvious question. Is this driven by uh, by COVID, or is this something that has nothing to do with COVID? No, it really has nothing to do with COVID. COVID has surprisingly had little impact, uh, at least in an aggregate level, on each of our platforms. We've both done pretty well through uh, this period. This is this is a growth year for us. We're significantly ahead of where we were uh, this time in 2019. Um, I say in the aggregate because obviously within the mix of businesses that we work with, there have been some businesses that have obviously Obviously, suffered under COVID, and 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 you know, in many cases, companies that had been doing great would have raised money, might have exited, uh, won't. But then on the flip side, you have a lot of businesses that have, in some ways, uh, uh, benefited from 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 the current market, and and a lot in between. So no, it isn't it isn't COVID driven at all. This is something that I think probably has made sense for a while, and just took us until this year to really get to the point where we could make it happen. That said, I mean, you've got to, each of you has your own proprietary platform. It's either or, isn't it? You can't bring two very different platforms together. Well, I think the goal, you know, the goal is that we will. I mean, I think, you know, each of us has different features 
that we're really proud of. Certainly Cedars, the secondary market uh, that we have built is a really robust and exciting sort of, you know, feature instead of technology. Crowdcube's built a great mobile app. Um, I would be way in over my head if I started talking about the technicalities of how they come together uh, and whether it's you start with one platform and then port some things onto it or whether you, you take the features of both and build a new platform. That's something that's going to be decided post-closing. But you no, know, the principle is to get to a combined platform that really takes the things that we both like the most about our respective platforms and sheds the things we don't like as much. Je Jemima, do you want to add, add a couple of questions to, to Jeff on this? My question, like all questions, like most of my questions to, to most fintechs, I guess, is um, how is it that you've still not made any money? Because <laughs> <laughs> as far as I can see, um, you take reasonably good fees, re reasonably healthy fees. I think they're about three and a half percent, are they? Or hey, give, give, give or take, depending on the deal. Um, and so it seems to me that that would be a reasonably, you know, lucrative thing. And you brought in between you, I think it's two billion over the last eight years um, pounds. So I just wonder. Yeah. The money been going. <laughs> well, look, I think, I think, I think, I think the, the genuine answer there is it has been a mix of of conscious decisions to reinvest in the business, um, as well as you know a a a, a struggle to scale as quickly uh, as we would have liked. So you know we have very intentionally. Uh, chosen to continue to invest in the technology, to continue to invest in things like international expansion. And when you know we've taken our revenues plus the capital that's been available to us, and we've had some very supportive uh, shareholders behind both businesses, behind Cedars and, and Crowdcube, that have wanted us to take that money and invest in further growth. You know, that's not uncommon, as you know, obviously in the venture back world. And so I think, you know, it, in, in many ways, that's been a decision. But at the same time, I would be the first to say uh, that we have not grown as quickly as we would like. Um, you know, it has been a long process. Uh, to Andrew's point, we were founded as a company in 2009, but launched in 2012. Crowdcube launched in 2011. Um, this is a long-term asset class, obviously. It takes, you know, it takes a while to show the product, you know, the products of what we've done. We're just now seeing in the last year or so the first real wave of exits from investments that were made five, six years ago. So it has been a long slog. It has taken a while. And I, and I do think that, you know, certainly one of the advantages of being able to uh, uh, come together with, with Crowdcube uh, is that we can, by having, you know, one sort of core set of operations rather than two to manage, operate more on a more marginally profitable basis uh, than we do today. Okay, let me bring in Leighton. Um, just very quickly, five minutes, no more, run through the agenda that you would like Jemima and Jeff to cover. Leighton, Leighton Hughes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, Jeff has, has taken the, the main, the cherry on top of the agenda uh, perfectly, um, which, uh, you know, the, the company is now valued at 140 million, I read in tech. Oh, he's parked his yacht outside, I mean, uh, <laughs> next to his private plane. <laughs> Uh, but I'll move on to the others. Um, so uh, Ant's um, lending business is really the driving force uh, behind its $30 billion IPO and subscriptions are due to come sort of in the next week or so, a few weeks. Um, something really to watch. I know they charge 2.4% um, on every, every, um, every loan, which is a healthy return uh, for a big market like China. Um, and Another was the small small businesses um, and the difficulty that they're facing um, in terms of uh, UK lenders um, giving them access to COVID loans. So this is really talking about Tide and uh, some of those um, sort of uh, disruptive firms. Other than that, I one thing that's really fascinated me is the uh, the SPACs and uh, particularly the development of an ETF um, of of SPACs. Um, which sounds really scary, um, but there's a. It's called the Defiance Next Gen SPAC IPO ETF, and uh, it actually only has 20% exposure to these sort of very uh, uh, pre-IPO companies. Um, but so 80% is sort of with Virgin Galactic and things like that. So it doesn't even do it capture any of that huge growth. But it's it sounds a bit scary and. Uh, I know people are saying, you know, these blank check ETFs um, really making waves. 
when you see Virgin Virgin Galactic as being the least risky part of the package, you have to wonder. That really is a moonshot. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, you know th these are. Um, I'm sure we'll talk a lot more about this, um, about what SPACs are and things. Uh, other than that, um, we're going to get onto the blockchain, SPACs, and the blockchain, as Jemima has written about recently. Um, Monzo 2.0, how they're uh, emerging um, in this new COVID world. Um, and there's actually an interview, not just with TS and Neil in that sifted piece that I shared, but also with Tom Blomfield at the end, which I wasn't expecting. Um, okay, well, let's move on to Jemima. The floor is yours. What's what's been tickling your fancy, and then we'll bring in Jeff, uh, Jeff and Leighton to comment on your comments. Jeff, uh, Jemima. Well, shall I just? Um, I'll just start with. I mean, I'll just go down the agenda. So I'll I'll kind of return to what Leighton just mentioned, which is mm -hmm. Ant and its lending business, because I thought that was a really interesting story because there's some there's quite a lot of um it kind of starts with this quite it's a story in the ft starting with quite a kind of anecdotal lead about a guy who like didn't realize that he was using that he was basically buying stuff on credit and so because ant uh, sorry alipay which is the payments bit of ant um is so uh it's, it's connected to the the loans the credit bit is is very is kind of all part and parcel of the alipay app and so you're kind of given this um choice to or, or you're not even really it's not even very clear that you are even being given a choice if you've ever kind of used one of their credit facilities before it just automatically um uses that when you're trying to pay and I've actually had this experience with Klarna in the UK. I mean, if I've paid with Klarna in the past, um, I then kind of get automatically, that gets automatically suggested to me. And obviously that's all on credit. Um, and so I think this piece is really flagging the kind of risks here. And, and to me it also, um, and I mean, there's quite a lot of like the average. So, so I think there's 500 million people using the credit facility. Um, and the average, the average amount was something like around $300 or something like that. Sorry, I've lost the actual figure um, that people are like currently like, oh, you know, so that's it's quite a lot of debt um, that they're taking on. They're, ma they're mainly kind of doing that via banks but they're kind of taking away a lot of this lending from um retail banks so they've kind of become like the the kind of um they have become the direct um service provider that you would go to for your lots of your financial services rather than going to your banks so they're kind of acting as a kind of middleman even though the banks might be providing the back end but anyway it seems to me that um you know the, the regulators have already cramped down a lot in China on and some of Ant's other activity, for example, the money market fund, you know, they regarded that as a systemic risk. And so that's like used to be the biggest money market fund in the world. And they've now they've now had to make that a lot smaller. Um, and so they've had to grow this lending business in order to kind of make up for the other bits that they've lost. And so they've had to keep and they've done it really successfully. Clearly, they're about to do the biggest. IPO that we've ever seen. Um, and so they've managed to kind of innovate every time the regulator has come in and kind of clamped down. But it seems to me that they inevitably are going to come in and clamp down on this lending because it seems quite risky. Um, and in, in August, also the Supreme Court ruled that the maximum interest rate on loans should be should be capped at 15.4% annually, which is um, which is, I guess, reasonably reasonably low um <laughs> considering what we pay in this country right exactly considering you know yeah we're kind of usury laws are not considered a good thing by most economists jeff right. do you have a view on this well i think two things perhaps just stood out to me uh in in in, in the article on this you know one was the crack the the the, the clamp the crackdown clamp down whatever you have on on other peer-to-peer -peer lending sources in 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 china um you know i i remember a few years ago uh you know that you know china was seen in many ways as the sort of the home of peer-to-peer -peer lending I mean, it was they perhaps you know flourishing in ways that maybe it shouldn't have um but it, it, it you know there were a vast number of platforms out there doing it and i hadn't appreciated until seeing this article which says about 99 percent of that is now gone thanks to 
regulation, which, you know, in many ways, I'm sure has been helpful. But at the same time, you know, when you clamp down on the upstarts, you then concentrate power in the incumbents. And as we well know, incumbents don't always use that power effectively. I guess the second slightly more prosaic observation is, you know, forcing credit on people or tricking people into taking credit um, has never worked out well in the long run. I mean, whether you think about the sort of, you know, the subprime housing uh, 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 market in, in the U.S. in the mid-2000s, or you go back to the days of the furniture shops and all that would, you know, ha- you know give you your TV, you know, sort of persuade you to take your TV or, or sofa on credit. I mean, that's always a bad outcome when people are being given credit that they don't necessarily want. Now, I have no idea here whether part of this is actually an arbitrage play by uh, Alibaba, that they're actually sort of playing on the merchant fees, and really these are people who are paying back uh, everything quickly, and using a credit card just as a payment means is 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 neither here nor there. But if this really is building up a whole pile of unwanted consumer credit, you know, I think we know how the story ends. We do indeed. Bright House was one in the UK. In my youth, we used to call it the never never, and I do think that is still the best the best <laughs> phrase. Jemima, continue down your agenda. Okay, sure. Um, So the next uh, story on the list is small businesses face ruin as UK lenders block access to COVID loans. So this is a story about um, these bounce back loans that are 100% guaranteed by the government, um, up to £50,000, no interest um, necessary, uh, you don't need to pay any interest for the first 12 months. Um, The problem is, even though there are 28 lenders that are advertised by the government as um, offering these bounce back loans, not all of them are actually currently offering these loans. And the reason is because the government might um, kind of back up those loans, but it doesn't actually provide the money for the loans. So uh, companies like Tide, which um, Leighton mentioned, which is a kind of challenger business bank, just don't have the money. And so there's been a huge amount of anger at Tide, for example. Um, there's also anger at Metro. And not only have they been unable to lend these people money, it's kind of the whole process has taken weeks. Um, and I've heard from my friend who has her own business that she tried to get a loan through, I think, Barclays or whoever her bank is. And she got it in like, you know, five minutes. And I think that this is um, really, I think this crisis is really, I'm actually thinking of writing something on this because I think it's really been quite bad overall for FinTech because I think what it's done, and I kind of think this theme emerges in quite a lot of the stories we have on the list today, but I think it has been a theme throughout the last several months, is it kind of, um, it just absolutely like, um, crushes the idea that fintechs are just like, just like as good as your regular financial institution, they can do everything it can do and more, and they can do it better. And unfortunately, they, they, they don't necessarily have the balance sheets to do what everyone else can do. They don't necessarily have the, um, you know, the, the, the infrastructure. They don't have the kind of massive amounts of, of you know, they don't have the huge... Um, you know, decades of experience to, to deal with all, with all of this. And they've well, kind there of- is another, There's another issue. I, I, I'm curious that you're focusing on that because there's another issue. I think the bounce back loans are supposed to come in at something like 43 billion pounds, but there is a national audit office report that says that I think 26 billion of that may well actually default. Yeah, they, they, expect, um, they expect they'll fail to pay between 35 and 60%. Yeah, okay, it's absolutely astonishing amount. But that's fine because, oh, the government backs it 100%. But the government also requires the institutions to do due due diligence. And if they they haven't done the due diligence, the government could step away from its guarantee. So why lend to a dodgy, potentially dodgy fintech, which itself doesn't have a kind of track record? So there's a double. I didn't didn't realise that, that there was a kind of... um, that there would that there could be potential kind of issues in the future if the government says that the, these companies haven't done their due diligence. I, I would. Jeff, do you have a view on this? Well, you know, it's interesting. I don't think the the default rate in and of itself doesn't concern me. I mean, I think I think these things have to be looked at, 
you know, as something between a loan and a grant. You know, you could, the governor could have chosen to do what Germany and some others have done, which is just write checks to, you know, every small business um, out there that needed them. And to an extent, they have in certain sectors. But I think the notion of structuring this as a loan, but with recognition that many will default is 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 not bad. The risk that the bank, the risk that the government walks away from the guarantee, hadn't really thought about it. I I, I would have thought that if a bank follows its own processes, um, you know, and 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 does its job, that the notion that the government's going to leave the banks out to, to hanging out to dry and the systemic issues that that could cause seem reduced, you know, seems limited to me. But it's an interesting point. Well, there's a lot of fraud involved with the bank with the bounce back loans, and that's the area, yeah. I think, rather than a genuine failure of an institution. But if if fraud is an element in that failure, then the government can. can that's a fair point. No, that's a very fair point. Je Jemima, back to you. Um, shall I move on? Hmm. Yeah, so now we are going to a story. Tech investment is the top priority for UK banks, a story in Finextra, which is based on a new survey from Lloyds Bank. So apparently nine in 10 uh, senior leaders at financial institutions um, say tech investment is the top strategic priority for the next 12 months, which is actually ahead of responding to the coronavirus pandemic, which is... Um, surprising I think and um I feel slightly alarmed that like no one is properly um facing up to what is ahead on that note but um anyway so there's, there's so it's kind of interesting that they put tech um ahead of of dealing with that um also there's a nice little nugget um despite continued prioritization prioritization of tech their focus on blockchain has decreased with only a quarter naming it, naming it as an investment priority compared to, compared with that should be, I think, 35% in 2019. Um, I would predict as a hardened blockchain cynic that uh, that will continue to decline. But I think it's quite interesting because it's the first time that I've seen a statistic like that um, showing that not only is you know blockchain not doing anything because i've kind of that's that's that it's never been really doing anything very interesting apart from providing the backbone for cryptocurrencies but it's actually stopped even being something that banks even want to talk about i'd kind of noticed that anecdotally but but it's kind of interesting that that's that's been um that's kind of gone down the priority list yeah uh, do, you have, do you have a view on this are you a, a blockchain aficionado I, I have moved increasingly into the blockchain skeptic world um, myself, not 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 out of any principled view, other than that I just it can it continues to look increase you know like a, a solution in search of a problem, and I, I continue to fail to see real serious applications of it outside certain very specific and niche areas. And I'm I'm open to be convinced. I mean, I'm this is I'm, I'm not religious on this. You know, if somebody, if I, if I, I, I would work with blockchain. I would get, I would get involved in blockchain-related businesses if, 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 if I could be convinced that the technology is solving a real problem. I just don't really see it yet. So I, I like Jemima. I find it very anecdotally. I've been hearing much the same thing. I find it very interesting to have a have a a, 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 a sort of semi-quantitative um, uh, uh, endorsement or support for that. More generally, on the issue of bank investment in technology. You know, I, I I don't know what to make of a survey like that because I kind of feel it's this the kind of thing where, unlike blockchain, which is a specific and kind of actionable thing, people can decide yes, this is something we're focusing on or not. You know, who feel who 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 inside a bank fills out a survey and says no, we're not investing in technology. I mean, I mean, you know, I I I I I think that strikes me as a a fairly general thing. I think, of course, all the banks are trying to become more productive through through their use of tech. I don't know that I'd read very much into it one way or the other. Jemima. Yeah, I think that's, I, I agree with that. Um, apparently a third of them said they would focus on improving their FinTech offering, whatever that means, because I mean, if they're focusing on tech, then surely that is FinTech, so it's strange, but um, apparently either via acquisitions or partnerships. So, I mean, a third of them wanting to do that is quite high, I guess. So I, I think that will probably be a, theme that will emerge over the coming 12 months as fintechs are put under financial pressure, not just from the fact that they are, you know, still not making any money and people are going to start to expect that they should, but also just because the economy is not going to be in a 
brilliant state. Um, so I imagine that that will kind of become a theme, kind of fintechs getting bought up and um, by kind of larger financial institutions. There was a really um, a really great uh, McKinsey report that said that uh, fintechs face an existential threat, and uh, I think that really that compares neatly with these UK banks investing in in technology as they perhaps try and sort of cover off those fintech competitors, try mm. uh, try and. Uh, entrench their own tech offering but i again as jeff says what does that mean <laughs> i also that, that mckinsey report was very interesting and a lot of the feedback in the fintech community was who are mckinsey's clients they're big banks what are you what what, what do they want to hear from mckinsey government, hm government well HM, sorry that's right and they had track and trace and all that they're the biggest they're the biggest that's a, that's, <laughs> that's a fair point but you know to, to some degree that mckinsey report read to many of us and i won't pretend I read the whole thing, but the, the the synopsis read to me and the full thing read to those who bothered to read it, uh, like a little bit of pandering to the base rather than a, a real view of, of the fact that this is the year that banks suddenly steal the march on fintechs. And, and you know, just quickly on that, I mean, back to the point Mama made earlier about the extent to which this the crisis has shown that fintechs aren't the all-seeing, all-knowing, can't do everything that the, the, the big institutional players do. I agree with that. And I don't necessarily think that that was ever the purpose. I think that, you know, fintechs in a kind of classic Clay Christensen disruptive innovation kind of way, at least for now, most fintechs are offering a simpler, more basic product that is that is all that certain types of customers need. But when you get to much more sophisticated offerings, you still need the larger financial institutions. Whether they then evolve up the chain someday, who knows? But I don't. I don't. I've never really seen it as being an, an, an either or or a battle to the death between the two. But that's the problem because that's the only way that they can that a lot of these fintechs can become profitable is that they are seen as that. And if so, if they do get all the customers migrate from their traditional banks uh, to the fintech challenger banks, so it's difficult, isn't it? Because that remains that issue. Where do you put your salary check? Right. Exactly. And I mean, I think that on that note, like everything that's been happening and we're going to come on to some some more stories about Revolut and stuff over you know in 2020 it kind of anyone who was thinking they might do that would have been quite put off by a lot of the kind no, of no I, I think certainly at least within the challenger bank world right. that's that's true I, yeah I think I'm talking particularly about them that's, yeah no that's fair that's fair um so should we move on to the next one which yep, is please. about Google so Google have deferred an enforcement of fees on their app store. So Androids are like the biggest phones in India. Um, and there's been a massive backlash against this enforcement of a 30% fee on some in-app in payments. And it's kind of quite interesting because apparently this is like the first time that, that Google have been forced into this kind of climb down. And it really shows, I think, that like, you know, India becoming kind of like, a real power in this particular, I mean, so actually this, this article talks about in India being the second biggest internet market, whatever that really means, an internet market. But um, apparently like, there's been a big um, pushback from, for example, Paytm, which is obviously a massive payments company in India. Um, and so Google is saying they're extending the time for developers in India to integrate with the play billing system. And they're holding talks with app developers to clarify the policy. But apparently companies um, like Netflix and Paytm had been working around the, because the, the, this fee system had already been in place, but they'd been working around it by getting people to pay on their websites, um, which I think is what they're trying to now, which Google is now trying to change. Um, so, and it's, there's been some kind of, some more, uh, a hostility is apparently between Google and Paytm because apparently Google temporarily. Is there an application for us in in the West? Is there what? Sorry, we going to be able to flex our muscles against Google, or will Google just roll right over us? I think that's a good question. I, I just think it's really interesting that India has managed this. And I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure that we would. I don't think in the UK we would be able to flex it, that kind of muscle. It's well, definitely. It, we'll have to get Rishi Sunak's father-in-law to do it for us. <laughs> it, it's a, it, it is a chink, in, it is another chink in the armor, though, 
of this whole 30% rake thing. I mean, I think, you know, the Apple is probably the one that's come under more fire because their system is stricter. Google Google's is is a little different in ways that I, I've never fully understood, but has not historically come in for quite as much uh, criticism. But I think after years and years of developers being so happy to have the distribution that comes through these app stores that they weren't paying as much attention to the rake, there's starting to be a, a sort of a, a little bit of kind of foment of dissatisfaction rising up, and 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 in you know looking at this thing in India, who knows if there's a direct application in the West, but you sort of feel like the guns are starting to to mobilize to, to sort of mix a metaphor, um, and uh, uh, who knows who knows if, if if it may change here too at some point. Jemima, um, okay, so I'll move on to. Um, the SPACs, because everyone seems very excited about SPACs. So SPACs, as we know, are special acquisition, no, special purpose acquisition companies. That's what a SPAC is. And often called a kind of blank check, check company. It's a way of, of a company raising funds without having to do an IPO. So it's a lot kind of easier. They just raise money and then they find companies that they want to merge with or buy up and often the um the people buy into them just you know because you have to kind of have blind faith that this is gonna that this is gonna turn out well um and so people buy buy into them on the basis of whoever's kind of leading them and surprise surprise never one to miss out on jumping on a bandwagon softbank have just announced one today or, or was it last night they announced it anyway as of today, there's a, there's a vision fund SPAC, which is extremely um, unsurprising. And I guess given that they, um, you know, they've just, you know, the, the, the dismal failure of the WeWork um, investment, I guess, you know, I guess they're looking for a way to, to make a bit of money fast. Um, so, um, so yes, yeah, so this is a really big new, um, well, it's actually not new. It's been around for a while, but it's I think- It's a South Sea company in the 18, early 18th century. Yes. Yes, it's the net, it's the kind of latest big kind of market craze and obviously a way of people raising money in quite a kind of easy it's like the new ICO. <laughs> Not quite as, as Are you are you as cynical as that Jeff or or do you see there there is something behind it? I mean I do think that there are wonderful opportunities out there and possibly covid has increased the number of opportunities or at least Made it made them more economical to buy in. Look, I I absolutely think that there is plenty of scope for effective use of SPACs. That said, um, this is I think the third time in my career uh, that the sort of SPAC boom has happened. Once, just as I was sort of beginning as a lawyer in the early two thousands, got popular again in the late two thousands after the after the crisis, and 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 yet again, and and you know, in the previous two times, we have seen for every success a heck of a lot of junk. Um, now that may be okay. I mean, I'm you know, look, I'm in. I believe in investing in small private companies. So I, I'm I'm a I'm a huge believer in in unequal distributions of returns or skewed distributions of returns. But I I, I am skeptical of the the view that seems to be taking hold in some regards that this is a a great panacea and and you know the idea of an ETF with widespread exposure here. Um, I don't know. Maybe 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 the net returns wind up being interesting. Uh, but I I I I think that. That enough has gone wrong with SPACs in the past, and nothing has convinced me that this new wave of them is so fundamentally different uh, that I think we, we're, we're likely to see a number of, 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 of failures in the years to come. And, you know, if it's priced in, you know, as I always say about high risk assets, you know, no, there's never a problem with a high risk asset if you expect it to be high risk. The problem always comes from the South Sea Company up through. Uh, 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 today, to, you know, when something is sold as being a dead cert, uh, and 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 it turns out not to be. So I think investors need to be going in with their eyes open, whether it's to direct SPACs or, or to an ETF. Um, I think there will be some successes, but I think we should be aware of aware of the history and, and conscious of the risks. Do you remember that? Sounds sensible to me. Dead yeah, cert to dead cat. And I agree with that. And I always say that about cryptocurrencies. Like, you know, if you want a wild ride, go for it. Like, you know, it's just that don't sell this as something that people, you know, some sort of safe haven and don't see it as that. And, you know, just be aware that you could lose all your money and it could get hacked and you could get your 
you know, you could forget your password or whatever, you know, all these risks. But I agree if you're, if you're aware. And I guess the ETF kind of gives it, it gives, gives, gives the SPACs um, this kind of semblance of like, you know, of, of. Um, I suppose the, the question that I, I would like an answer to is if you're looking at it from the, from the other point of view, looking at it from the point of view of the company that is seeking angel investment, startup investment, round one, round two investment, do the SPACs really look good or, or is the price that they impose on you too great? Well, I, I, I think that they are a very valid uh, alternative to trying to, to go into the public markets on your own. I mean, I don't think one would take, you know, one, one would likely, as a small business, would be wild about taking an investment from a SPAC in lieu of, say, uh, you know, a private venture or um, venture type investment because it puts a whole different set, set of burdens on. But where I do think SPACs as a structure can be interesting is that it makes life a lot easier to go public rather than going public directly as a long-term operating company with all of the complexities of disclosures that go with it. So in that regard, I do... I, I could see the appeal, and if I were, you know, if I were running a business that were on the verge of going public, I would be potentially interested. Oh, Jemima. Yes. Um, should I move on? Yeah. When the back met, met the blockchain, there's one of mine from Alphaville. Uh, it was only a little story, but Leighton kindly put this on the list. <laughs> it was just a. Um, we have a series on Alphaville called the Axes of Evil, which. Um, is about chart crime, essentially. And someone had sent me a uh, slide from a, an investor presentation from a SPAC called Netfin, which is a NASDAQ listed SPAC that was that um, was uh, planning to acquire this blockchain company. Uh, it was actually a company called Triterra Fintech, but their flagship platform is, a, is called Kratos, which is a custom built blockchain enabled end-to-end -end global trade and, uh, and trade finance platform. And the, the graph just showed this exponential growth with all these completely meaningless kind of lines going here and there. Um, they called it kind of, they said that there was potential exponential, you know, organic growth opportunity. And it was just one of these silly this is, kind of- This is the one where you found 15 uses of the word potential. In uh, the that no, that was actually a story that isn't on the list because it's from today. Uh, that was a report from PwC that was embargoed, so it was out today, it was embargoed to midnight. That's talking about blockchain's potential, and they reckon it's going to add 1.73 trillion, is it, to the world economy by 2030? Um, it was a ridiculous, ridiculous report. And yes, and they had the word potential 15 times and potentially, potentially it's right. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. And they also had some ridiculous graphs. Um, no, so that was, that's not on the list, but yes, um, it could have been. Same principle, keep going. Principle. Another blockchain story again, you know, uh, but this one was kind of interesting because I didn't know that Ant, I'd kind of, I'd, I'd kind of forgotten that Jack Ma is a massive blockchain fan. Um, he's really bigged up blockchain a lot in the past. In fact, in 2018, he gave an interview to the South, Mo South Morning, South China Morning Post, sorry, um, in which he said that, <laughs> which he said that we have to turn to blockchain, otherwise it would be fatal, apparently. I don't know if he said that in English or, or, or Cantonese or whatever, but um, I mean, fatal, meaning, you know, matter of life and death seems a bit strong to me. But anyway, Ant Financial have a blockchain uh, who are just about to IPO, so kind of interesting, I thought, and newsworthy, um, have a kind of blockchain project, which used to be called Ant Blockchain, but they've just relaunched it, uh, and it's called Ant Chain. And um, it is the Ant Chain is uh, a new technology brand for Ant Group's blockchain based solutions that also aggregates other digital technologies, including AI, Internet of Things, and secure computation, which to me is just a classic like, let's just get all the buzzwords all the words. <laughs> together and it or something will come out. So, this is all a bit stupid to me, but then. Uh, 
Now, Chris Skinner, I was forgetting, it's Chris Skinner, who I'm sure, who I think has been on, on this panel before, who's definitely, uh, who you'll definitely be aware of, um, Andrew and, and, and everyone else. Um, he had put up a video uh, of this extraordinary video of a whole load of old people in uh, somewhere in China singing um, about ant chain and saying all the things that you could do with the blockchain. And they had you know, props and they looked really happy and they were saying, you know, you, you millennials are going to get left behind because us boomers, it was really strange. Someone translated it. Us boomers are, you know, we, we're using blockchain to track the supply chain of tan shan pears, trace it from farm to table. Do you know us boomer? We all know you young fellas already got left behind. Get on blockchain, get on blockchain, get on ant chain. It's an extraordinary video. I would, I would encourage everyone to watch it. It's linked in my story. But it turns out, because I was like, where has this come from, this video? And ants were trying to say to me that it was a, some, some elderly college, so some university for, they were calling it elderly, I mean, you know, for senior citizens, had just voluntarily done this, which I was quite skeptical about because it turned out they'd made this video like within 36 hours of the relaunch of Ant Chain, or in fact, it had been posted on Twitter with the English translation within 36 hours. And I was like, well, when, how could that this choir have done this so quickly and come up with this song, which was in the uh, melody, the melody was using Sound of Music's um, The Lonely Goat Herd. It's very beautiful. Um, anyway, it turns out actually that this university is the, el this qu qu university choir is the elderly university of Alipay choir. So this is a <laughs> senior citizens college the Alipay sponsors as part of their philanthropic project. And Ant maintains that this, this video was made entirely voluntarily. And you know, there's nothing, so you can see there's nothing in it for Ant to kind of sponsor this university. Of, you know, they can just use them to do these, you know, free advertising with them. So, and it went viral apparently in China, this video. Um, so quite a good, uh, quite an intro, I don't know what you'd call that, like getting some old people to sing for free I guess they didn't pay them because, you know, they're paying. Oh, oh, oh. Don't well, make any assumptions. Well, they said it was voluntary. They said they just did it of their own accord. That's what Ant told me. That's literally what Ant told me. So it's quite a, a, a clever thing that to kind of. Get isn't, it, isn't, it volunt isn't it likely to have been voluntary in the same way that so many things in communist authoritarian systems are voluntary? Yes, we voluntarily support the dear leader. I mean, I, you know. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, I would hate to suggest that, but you have. So okay, on. move on. <laughs> okay, so the, um, the next story is also one of mine, three in a row. Um, this is about the IPO. So um, I wrote uh, last, in September, about this bank that the Telegraph had written about called Mode, which is the um, which is a project from a guy called Jonathan Rowland, who is the son of David Spotty Rowland, who is one of Britain's richest men, is a pal of Prince Andrew, went to his wedding. Uh, sorry, no, not, not to his wedding, went to Princess, or was invited to Princess Beatrice's wedding, I think it was, or one of those, one of the daughters, one of the, Eugenie, Eugenie. I don't know how exclusive that makes him. Well, anyway, apparently he's quite good pals with Prince Andrew. He even got to use his, like, private jet and stuff. So anyway, um, but he, uh, Jonathan Rowland is a serial, uh, well, what I guess he would call himself a serial entrepreneur. I would call him a serial kind of hype meister jumps on, loves to, to, to jump on a bandwagon. And in the dot-com boom, um, had this internet uh, business called Jellyworks, which was one of the kind of UK, kind of poster children of the kind of UK dot-com bubble uh, that kind of burst. Um, that he then kind of launched this during the kind of social media boom in 2011, he launched something called Jelly Book. So he was kind of attached to this Jelly uh, name for some reason. Um, which didn't work out either. He then launched a business bank. Anyway, he's now launched this this Bitcoin bank, as the Telegraph named it, called Mode, um, in which you can... M-O-D-E, uh, M -O -D -E, Mode. Um, in which you can, like, keep Bitcoin along, along with your other currencies. Like, I mean, it's like, to me, it just looks like a lot of other com companies. You know, we had... Um, who, who did we have when we did our Bitcoin uh, video? We had the guy from... What's that company called again? Uh, Zigloo, Zcash, Zigloo. Exactly. Zigloo, Zigloo. So, I mean, I don't really see, for example, what differentiates it from something like that. 
but they reckon they can take on Monzo. I'd written about them last month because I didn't think they looked uh, like very much. Or this guy had kind of come to my attention because he's done, he's kind of jumped on so many bandwagons. Now they've done their IPO, which they said they were going to do. Um, and it's just really unclear why they bothered because <laughs> they raised seven and a half million, which is really small, you know, and they're listing on the main London Stock Exchange. It's not even AIM listed. Um, and it turns out that the only bit of investment that I could find that was not either existing investors or con directly connected to the family, I mean, like, so David Spotty Rowland is the, like, second biggest shareholder after Jonathan, um, and then all of the other, if you look through the big shareholders, they're all basically connected to either the Rowland family or to some of the other directors. I could only find 1.8 million, which was something that I couldn't directly connect, which was from Premier Myton, um, who'd, who'd, who'd invested 1.8 million. But the actual listing cost was like 525,000. So God knows why they decided to do this IPO. Was it a kind of vanity IPO? Was it a way of getting, who, who knows, very strange. But the other strange thing was in the IPO prospectus, they had said that some former contractor was suing them and they just kind of mentioned it, you know, you know, in other information. Turns out that this former contractor who did actually begin as a former contractor, but he then became the CEO of Mode. <laughs> and it's the CEO who's actually suing them, the former CEO, who is claiming that he was actually wrongfully dismissed, that he's owed £90,000 plus 10% of, uh, of, of, of a 10 stake in the company. Obviously, Mode are saying that they are strongly refuting all of these claims. And I mean, I've seen the particulars of the claim. They haven't actually... A, uh, provided a um, defense yet. Yeah, they've actually asked for a um, an extension, which 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 the um, the former CEO has provided. But Very All of this aside, all of this aside, is there a business case behind it? No, not as far as I can see. Not no, Do you have a view, Jeff? Are you aware of this? Yeah, look, I I, I know Jonathan a bit, and I actually quite oh. like him. He's a nice chap. Oh, I'm sorry. But but but. Um, nothing I have seen, I haven't spoken with him in a while, I haven't spoken with him about this particular business, nothing I have seen, at least on paper, convinces me that there's anything there, and, 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 and I agree that I know that, I know he has a, I know he likes the public markets and, and has a sort of leaning in that direction to, 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 to use them perhaps faster than many entrepreneurs would. I agree completely about the peculiarity of listing at that size, um, you know, particularly on the main market. So no, I'm, I'm, I, I have nothing, you know, you know, nothing negative to say about him personally. But I, I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't get this. Can I just add? Well, I'm amazed I, at the fee. The, the, that's the fee for listing on the main market. Even that is that size. Which, it, well, the, but that's why you don't list, you know, you don't do seven and a half million pound listings on the main market. Yeah, exactly. Which is why it's so odd. Can I just say as well, I have never spoken to Jonathan Rowland, despite asking, you know, the, the PR, you know, to speak to him for both of these stories. But uh, and so I don't I can't speak for his uh, personal, you know, what he's like as a person, other than to say that on Twitter, after I'd written my last article, he said that it sounded like an unhappy girlfriend writing a text late at night. And he then threatened me with lawyers and he deleted both the texts. So he didn't kind of come across to me as particularly- you, I think you've got your own back. Let's move on. Moving on. <laughs> EU proposes first set of rules for crypto assets. This is a story from Fin Extra. So apparently the European Union has taken a major step forward in its bid to kind of regulate the crypto market. Apparently if this goes through, it's kind of trying to uh, you know, um, define all sorts of different kind of crypto assets, including um, stable coins, which have kind of have been quite uh, have been obviously a growing thing in recent years, and there've been quite a lot of concerns about in terms of, you know, how much uh, how much should they be backed by, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but apparently, so this it kind of in theory this would make the EU the most like um you know have the most kind of stringent and kind of robust regulation anywhere in the world but in practice it's going to be quite difficult for it to go to to kind of get through there are kind of se several um hurdles it has to be debated by the european parliament and then also all the national governments um they hope it can be passed by 2024 but it seems like there's quite a lot of um hurdles to go through before then okay um, Keep, keep going. We've only got about five minutes left. Okay, sure. So um, there was a story here in Sifted about, um, that Leighton mentioned at the start about Monzo and um, how it stuffed its executive ranks with what it calls white hairs. Um, very rude. 
um, people with some experience. Um, they also use a word that I have not come across and that I will not be using ever again, monzonaut, which apparently <laughs> they have been with the with the, the bank uh, since the start. Anyway, so there's some they've 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 kind of identified eleven people that they think are kind of the, the key players in the new um, revamped Monzo. Obviously, the first of whom is the new CEO, T.S. O'Neill, who was until recently, until Tom Blomfield stepped down, was the CEO of Monzo America, uh, which obviously they're trying to crack. It's quite interesting. He's never actually met most of the Monzo team, he says, because of obviously COVID. So he's like coming to the role in the middle of the pandemic. So he hasn't actually met anyone which does which seems a tiny bit suboptimal for the CEO but anyway uh he said some interesting things I mean when I say interesting the whole thing was quite funny because it was just such a PR exercise if you just let people if you just do a Q&A like that I mean it's 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 I like actually seeing it because sometimes they're trying to say the right thing but they're inadvertently kind of giving away something that they probably didn't mean to perhaps but his was incredibly PR-y. Um, they say, he was asked, what is the biggest potential, the single biggest threat to Monzo? And he says, our biggest threat is that we don't live up to our own potential. That's just like a classic, isn't it? In like a job interview, like what's your, we your, what's your biggest weakness? Oh, well, that I don't live up to my, you know, that I'm, my potential is too big and I, you know, whatever. It's just a silly- Humility. Humility. Yeah. Uh, and he also says, you know, you know, if Monzo were to sell, which companies would you would you prefer acquire? And you know, oh, we have no plans to sell. Our goal is just to bring an exceptional banking experience at global scale, global scale, blah, 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 blah. So it's all, you know, quite PR-y, but quite interesting things. So for example, the chief, there's some other excerpts from other people. The chief product officer says that do you see Monzo more of a tech company or of a finance company? He says it's a false choice. And he says banks and finance companies were in some sense the original tech companies um, with the first management account services in the 70s. Uh, we're not a purely digital company. We don't operate in the ether. So again, I mean, he's kind of making the point that I would, which is that why is a fintech any more techie than a bank? You know, why isn't a bank a fintech? It's kind of, um, uh, I, I kind of agree with that. Um, so uh, yeah, there's some kind of, I won't go through, I know we haven't got very much time left, so I won't go Monzo through. Too. What's, uh, what's your view, Jeff? On Mon Monzo, Monzo's new leadership. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I mean, I, 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 I think, um, I think the jury's very much out. I'm a big believer in replacing leadership uh, as a company grows. I stood down as CEO when it, we moved from a sort of startup to scale up, and uh, uh, I brought in a proper CEO. I think it's a good move, and I think most businesses should do it. The extent to which they basically cleaned out their entire upper ranks and replaced so you know in such short order uh, would make me nervous and 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 you know I, I wonder if they will be able to preserve much of the sort of culture and spirit that got them to where they are and you know they've among you know in addition to their quality as a bank and fintech whatever you want to say about that they've been an outstanding branding you know business an outstanding business in terms of generating customer loyalty. Will that stay? I don't know. I think it's all to, to be seen, but it was an interesting article and interesting to see the perspectives. Right, move on to Revolut. Okay, sure. So um, there's some there's a, a story here about shares options. Um, there's been some frustration because people, employees were, were promised share options and they were in fact, um, during the kind of uh, the height of the lockdown, they, um, the way that Revolut were trying to cut costs was, because they didn't actually furlough anyone, unlike Monzo, they were just, they kind of carried on pursuing their very aggressive growth strategy. And so rather than cutting any staff, they did, they offered um, the staff a chance to swap some of their salary uh, for share options. Um, and they could actually be exchanged. So like one pound of salary could be exchanged for two pounds uh, of share options in the future. So a lot of people did this, but then there's been, apparently it's just been really like mishandled and there's been a massive delay and some people have left and have not even, you know, been given anything. So, but re apparently now it's all, um, it's all kind of sorted. Apparently there's still some confusion over the value of how much these share options are, but it seems like it's just a bit of a kind of badly handled internal uh, palaver is my, my kind of take. Okay, I want to, I mean, we, we, only got about five minutes left. Yeah. I want to ask you a more philosophical question over the takeover of ARM, um, by the proposed takeover of ARM by NVIDIA. And 
I just don't know whether, particularly, Jeff, you're an expatriate who's made a career in, in the UK, whether the UK is in danger of selling the family silver and selling it too cheap. Does this, do, ought this to worry us more than it does? Well, look, I mean, I think as a, a slightly technical and pedantic question, if we were selling the family silver, we already did it when 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 SoftBank took its holdings some some time ago. I mean, I, th I think, you know, in, in, in arm, I think to some degree the ship has sailed. But look, I mean, I, I'm a capitalist. You know, I believe that that, 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 that you know, capital should flow to its most productive uses. And if NVIDIA is in the best position to capitalize on everything ARM has built, you know, there's a part of me that says, you know, power to them. But I also, you know, do have a great fondness for my adopted country. I'm a big believer in our ability, uh, our potential, sorry to use that word, but our, our real potential to build, you know, the, the, the next generation of mega tech businesses. And yes, it's a shame. It's a shame that for whatever reason, um, uh, 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 you know, ARM is not in a position or has not been in a position to stay independent and, and, and you know, and primarily UK, uh, UK owned. So I'm sorry to see it. I hope, um, I hope to see, you know, I, I hope that in the next generation of great tech businesses that's being built, simply being sold to the Japanese of the US won't be the go-to outcome. Well, I, I, after all, Jemima works for a, a Japanese conglomerate, um, what's what's your your feeling? I mean, the, the FT is um, agnostic on this, but we've had Herman Hauser uh, on this video saying this is a disaster. Um, I, we're about to have a, a new book by Alex Brummer, admittedly of the Daily Mail rather than of the Financial Times, but we're going to interview Alex, and Alex also thinks this is a disaster. This is you know bad for Britain's tech. The fact that we uh, we don't fight for our companies as much, we will lose the, the the research as we have done in other sectors as well. Does um, what do you feel, Jemima? I mean, instinctively, I think I feel a little bit like it's a bit of a shame, but I, I can't say that I, I don't feel extremely sure about my position, essentially, I think. I don't, I don't really know. I don't feel like, strangely, I don't have a strong opinion on this. Okay. I, I kind of feel instinctively like it is a bit of a shame to kind of, for all these, you know, we've we've lost a lot of, you know, obviously British manufacturing and car companies, et cetera, over the years. And I guess in some ways that feels like a bit of a shame, but I'm not quite sure why. And I don't, I just don't know if I have a strong opinion on that. FT is very happy under its Japanese ownership. Can I ask the yeah, three of you? we are actually. Yeah, we've yeah. Japanese in Japanese is great. I have to say, I think um, your management um, negotiated the most astonishing package when uh, when it went into Nikki's hands in terms of preserving editorial independence. And the Japanese have looked up to it. Let me ask the three of you what you're looking for over the next month, Leighton. What are your concerns over the next month? Um, so I, as ever, I'm I'm watching Klarna very closely. Um, I've, I've, they've recently done a partnership with um, Macy's who have, look, who have or are looking to take a stake in Klarna. I think uh, looking at the pathway to uh, US IPO for Klarna is really interesting to me. So that's something I'll be looking at. Jeff, what do you I think? I think more, more broadly, I'm looking very closely at the impact on second wave COVID on, on, on the small business and startup community. You know, I think, I think everything, we made it through first wave through a combination of things, um, you know, government and, and private sector support uh, that I think, you know, have meant the damage has been much less than it could have been. And I feared it would be in March, April. Uh, I just don't know how well uh, everything is geared up to withstand a long winter. Um, and I think we're going to begin to see some of the early signs, as I say, in the startup community, but the, the small business community more generally um, over the next month. And we'll be watching that very closely. The final word, Jemima, is with you. I mean, I guess if we want to go even more broadly, there is a little event coming up in the next month, which is the US election. And I guess I will be <laughs> looking very closely at that because it's quite a big deal. And actually, I'm sure we'll have implications for fintech the world over as well as everything else the world over. Uh, All right. Well, well, let me ask Jeff because I, I don't know if you, you if you've given up your American passport. No, nope. you've already sent in your vote. I have. I have. I have. I have already voted um, uh, and agreed that this is going to be a a very, very significant election. Um, what does it mean for fintech, if anything? 
Look, I I am of the view, um, and I say this as a naturally relatively conservative free markets person, but I am of the view that where the parties stand right now, uh, the the Democratic Party and the Democratic candidate are are going to are better for you know almost all aspects of the markets, including big tech. I think that we're going to have a more closed, more parochial, um, and simply you know m- you know m- more challenged environment. Um, under another four years of, of Trump leadership. Uh, uh, how that manifests itself, who knows? I've, I've learned enough not to try to predict anything that uh, Mr. Trump does. Um, but I think that the growth of fintech, frankly, on both sides of the Atlantic, will be in better shape uh, under, under a Biden presidency. That's despite the fact that part of the Democratic agenda is an attack on big tech. And uh, Alexandria... Ocasio-Cortez and her friends would very much like to do to big tech what was done to Standard Oil. And I, I look, and I oppose, I oppose that thoroughly, but I think there's a very big difference between Joe Biden uh, and, and, and AOC. And I think, I think the Republicans work very hard to paint them with the same brush. But I think the reality is that you know, at least 70% of the Democratic Party is still a fundamentally center-left party. I have very little time for the extreme 30% on the far edge, and they may be effective in moving the Overton window over time. But the leadership that's on the ballot today, I think is not necessarily gonna be aligned with me in all regards of the policy. As I say, I'm a naturally conservative person, but better, but it's gonna be better on the whole for the markets and for tech. Uh, 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 than a Republican administration. Final word, Jemima, having raised the uh, American election. I was just, it just struck me that I guess if Trump were in charge of the UK, your concerns about ARM being taken over by NVIDIA, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be having any of that, would he? You know, he's very protective. So I guess, you know, we could see he, he, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what the relationship with uh, China will be kind of when it comes to tech companies and stuff under a, what I expect will be a Joe Biden presidency. Don't assume that there'll be any big change. Biden has his friends in the AFL-CIO who are even more anti-Chinese than uh, the Republican administration. On that happy note, me lecturing and others on American politics is probably not very productive, but can I thank you, Jeff? Can I thank, as always, Jemima and my colleague, Leighton, and of course, you all for watching. Many thanks.